Chris, uh, coming few months, few in the rest of the year, we're going to be having a preaching theme. And it's going to be built on our theme that Max just introduced. So we're going to be taking the life of some of the great men and women of faith and working through them and seeing what we can learn from their lives. So it's going to be an interesting time. I'm starting it off today and uh, I'm going to be looking at the part of the life of Abraham. So when I preach over the next few months, I'll be preaching on the life of Abraham. How's that sound? Good? That's good. (laughs) So the first question is, who was Abraham? Remember the old song about the bone of Abraham and all, all that sort of stuff? Well, Abraham was a native of Chaldea, a descendant of the ninth, ninth generation from Shem, who was the son of Noah. So we're going right back into the Old Testament a long way. His father's name was Terah, and he was born in 2161 BC. So that's nearly uh, 4,000 years ago, isn't it? Or well, over 4,000 years ago, in the country of Ur. Now in scripture, Abraham is known as the father of faith. Romans 4, uh, 16 says, So the promise was received by faith. It is given as a free gift, and we all are certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. If we have faith like Abraham's, for Abraham is the father of all who believe. Isn't that terrific? The life of Abraham from his death consists, or from his call to, to his death, consists of four main periods. There was the call, which we want to look at today. There was the promise, then the covenant, and then the test. Now, some of you who have been reading the Bible for a long time will already be figuring out some of these things. So, But today we're going to talk about the call of Abraham found in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 9. And in, it will, in it we'll see God's promises not only to Abraham, but to us. Our responsibility to him, our response to God's challenge, and our reaction to God's promises to us. So let's, if you've got your phone there or your Bible, let's turn to uh, Genesis chapter 12 and we'll read the first nine verses. The Lord, now, one of the things you find about Abraham is his name changes from Abraham, Abram to Abraham. So if I get mixed up, you will get mixed up too. <laughs> okay? So the Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your family, father's family and go to a land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So that includes us today. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot and all his wealth, his livestock and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran and headed for the land of Canaan. When they arrived in Canaan, Abraham, Abram travelled through the land as far as Shechem where he set up a camp beside the Oak of Morah. At that time the area was inhabited by the Canaanites. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I will give you this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. After that, Abram travelled south and set up camp in the hill country with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. There he built another altar and dedicated it to the Lord and he worshipped the Lord. Then Abram continued travelling south by stages toward Negev. The first thing we notice about these verses is that in order to activate the promises of God, we have to respond to his challenge. That's interesting, isn't it? In order to activate the promises of God, we have to respond to his challenge. We've often heard of God referred to as the great I Am, but another name we could easily use in referring to him is the great I Will. You do this and I'll do that. 
God invited Abraham to leave his life of emptiness to receive a life of blessing. God's invitation involved personal, national and universal blessing. God will also make Abram's descendants into a great nation, not in a worldly sense, but as a special treasure to God, a holy nation. And we'll look at that a bit later on. The personal blessing would naturally include the spiritual blessing, and all of these blessings would make his reputation great, thus making him famous. God's blessing also brings his provision and power for our needs. If Abraham responds to Yahweh's invitation, God tells him, I will make you into a great nation, I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. God's call to Abraham is enclosed in a conditional statement. One of the most important words in, in the all of Scripture is the word if. Have you ever thought about that? If. If we will do this, then... God will do that. And that's what God is saying to Abraham. The results of Abraham keeping God's command would be threefold. God would make him a great nation, God would bless him, and God would make him famous. How would you like those things in your life? The first thing that God promises Abraham is that he would make him into a great nation. From Abraham, the Arabs and Jews alike, Trace their origin. More than one nation now calls Abraham father, and God not only made him into a great nation, but into many nations. And we'll look at that a little bit later. The power for success, uh, to bless in the Old Testament means to endure with power for success, prosperity, and longevity. The second part of to make him famous, the reverence of millions in three great monotheistic faiths, Christianity, Judaism and Islam, have more than fulfilled that promise. See, the whole of the... More, the, the uh, Islamic faith comes from Abraham as well. Well, again, it's all stuff that is interesting, but you've got to really follow it all through. The end of verse 2 is not a part of a blessing, but is actually a command. The fact, this fact is often missed in English. The second command is to be a blessing. God doesn't bless us so that we can brag about it, how blessed we are, but rather that we can be a blessing to others. God illustrates this by telling Abraham that he will not only bless him, but he will also bless others through him. In verse 3, God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and curse those who treat you with contempt. All of the families on earth will be blessed through you. So again, that applies to us today. The word in the verse 3 shows God's determination to assist Abram in becoming the blessing that he has commanded him to be. The force of the Hebrew in the first blessing here shows God's determination. It literally means... I am determined to bless those who bless you. I am determined to bless those who bless you. The second blessing shows more of God's obligation to treat with contempt those who show contempt to Abraham. When God blesses someone, he puts that person under his care and protection and favour. But a few would despise the promise and keep reviling, mocking or making light of Abram. The word contempt actually means to make light of. God would curse them by putting them under divine judgment. The blessings for all the families on earth refers to God's plan to reverse the curse of Genesis 3 and all the effects of the fall. We haven't got time to look at that this morning. The promise of divine salvation blessings is repeated five times in Genesis and becomes an important theme throughout the whole Bible. Ultimately, the promise looks ahead to Jesus, for it is only through him we become Abraham's seed and heirs of the great promise. You know, a wealthy businessman lay on his deathbed. The pastor came to visit him and talked about God's healing power and prayed for his parishioner. 
might have been Steve. When the pastor was done, the businessman said, Pastor, if God heals me, I'll give the church a million dollars. Wouldn't that be interesting? Miraculously, the businessman got better and within a few short weeks was out of hospital. Several months later, the pastor bumped into the businessman on the street and said, You know, when you were dying in hospital, you promised to give the church a million dollars if you got well. Well, we haven't received it yet. The businessman replied, Oh, did I say that? I guess that goes to show how sick I really was. <laughs> So we can often make promises, but uh, when it comes to the pinch, that's the fill of Dewey. We are heirs to the promises of Abraham, Galatians 3.29 says, And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true, uh, true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Wow, isn't that terrific? Just as God made a promise to Abraham, he makes the promise to you and me as well today. Just as God fulfilled a promise to Abraham, he will fulfill his promise to you and me. And just as Abraham could lean on the promises of God, we can lean on the promises of God too. All of God's promises to us are in Jesus Christ are yes. Second Corinthians 1.19 For Christ Jesus, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. He is the one who Silas, Timothy and I preach to you as God's ultimate yes. He is the one who always does what he says. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. Everybody say yes. 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 Yeah. And through Christ our amen, our yes, ascends to God for his glory. We can count on the promises of God because we can count on Jesus. We can count on the promises of God because Jesus has already paid the price. We've heard about that in our communion this morning. God's promises are faithful because Jesus is faithful. However, to release God's blessing requires something on our part. All of the promises of God require an affirmative result response from us in order to unleash God's blessing. Malachi 3.10 Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out, pour out a blessing on you so great you won't have enough room to take it all in. Try it. Put me to the test. Isn't that terrific? Put me to the test. If Abraham wanted to receive God's promises, he had to be willing to obey God's command. In Old Testament times, the covenant, or the Berit in Hebrew, was at the foundation of social relationships. It might represent a treaty between nations, or business contract, or a national constitution. In each case, it was represented by a binding agreement expressed in a firm commitment which was to be faithfully honoured by all. In verse 1 we read, The Lord said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. The first three steps of chapter, three verses of chapter 10, 12, contain two commands, followed by promises or blessings by following these commands. The first command is leave, and it is followed by three promises if Abraham obeys that command. Now this is not a sharp command, but an urging of a gracious invitation, a call to separation from his old life of idolatry that had taken over the whole world, but also a separation to worship and service of the Lord. We had a separation from his old life of idolatry that had taken over the whole world, but also a separation to worship and service of the Lord. And we'll see that as we work our way through. Abram had to move, trusting God for guidance. But the fact that God was going to show him the land was significant. 
what God was asking of Abraham is not easy, but it was necessary if Abraham was going to receive the promises. First, Abraham was settled in his life. Abraham was about 75 years old when God asked him to leave. So nearly as old as some of us, older than some of us. He was probably settled in his life and fixed for the future. He was undoubtedly a part of the family business as most of the males in his time were. So very nicely settled into life. Thank you very much. He was asked to leave the only life he had ever known. He was asked to leave the only home he had ever known. He was asked to leave the only family he had ever known. However, as always the case with God, he was offering Abraham something far better. Isn't that interesting? He was promising to make a man who had no children of his own into a great nation. How is that going to work? He was promising to make an obscure individual famous. Again, yeah, pretty funny, isn't it? As we will see, he promised him a land for his descendants, which he didn't have yet. You see the picture? <laughs> One of the things God's promising to Abraham, he's got no hope of Canterbury those things the way it is at the moment. He promised to protect him, to bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. Charles Finney, one of the most have noted this about obedience and sacrifice. Now listen to this. Revival is nothing more or less than a new obedience to God. Now we hear a lot of people talk about revival as, you know, one, you know something wonderful, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. But revival is nothing more or less than a new obedience to God. So we could have a great revival here this morning if all of us decided that we were going to obey God and live for him in a very new and special way. Is that what we want? Of course it is. God begins our covenant with him by asking us to receive him. And we've, a lot of us have already done that. John 1.12 But to him, those who, to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. We're not in the covenant with God because we go to church. We're not in the covenant with God because of our parents. We are only in the covenant with God when we accept the gift of his salvation. No other way. The second part of the covenant with God is that he asks us to change. Romans 12, 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So how do we get to know God? We've got to change the way we think. God doesn't call us into a covenant with himself so we can stay the same. God doesn't call us into a covenant with himself so we can go our own way and do our own thing. God calls us into covenant so that we can become more like him every day of our lives. The third aspect of our covenant with God is that we obey him. 1 Samuel 15, 22, But Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, or your obedience to his word, his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than an offering of the fat of lamb. We want to, if we want to be in covenant with God, we have to be willing to live according to his word. If we want to be in covenant with God, we need to be willing to become holy just as he is holy. And if we want to be in covenant with God, we need to be doing the things his way. So what does Abraham do in response to God's call? Very simple. What did he do? He obeyed. It's that simple, isn't it? Verse 4 says, So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left her. Abram's response to God's call is unmistakable. 
we see him do the thing, two things that God required of him. First, he left his home. Notice that he doesn't hesitate or think about it or make excuses. He just does what God commands him to do. Verse 5 said he took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran, and headed for the land of Canaan. The second thing he did in response to God's call was he was a blessing. He influenced others to join him in following Yahweh's call. The journey from Haran to Canaan was about 500 miles and takes nearly a month to complete. Well, that's a fair old trip, isn't it? In those days, it took great faith to undertake a journey like this one. Hebrews 11 verse uh, 8 says, It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. Many of us obeyed God's call and we set out on a journey we not knowing where we're going. Well, just to one extent, it's when we're born again, we do that, don't we? We don't know where we're going to end up. Abraham demonstrates his faith by obeying God, even though he was completely unfamiliar with the land to which he was going. This shows us that faith consists of acting with reference to the unseen. It's important to note that the promises that his descendants would the promise that his descendants would inherit the land did not come until Abraham was already in Canaan. And the promise would not be realized by Abraham himself, but by his offspring. Now remember, at this stage, Abraham had no offspring. He did not go into the land to possess it, but to live it out as an act of obedience to God. Isn't that one? Also, his mode of living in Canaan, dwelling in tents, served as a symbol of his commitment not to settle into the earthly cities of the Canaanites, but to seek a more permanent city built by God. Now, a few years ago, I was working overseas and was working in Dubai, and Dubai is a very interesting city. It has a lot of detail, but part of it, they had a big area set up as it was, in the days of old. And they had tents set up there, and the, the reference to it was, as in the days of Abraham, and Abraham would have lived in this sort of tent. But it wasn't very flash, I can tell you. I meant to bring you a photo of it. But it was just a just a pretty ordinary sort of tent, so I if the wind blew, it would have blew it all away. But Abraham decided to live in the tent instead of building a place of permanence that God hadn't given him yet. Henry Black, Black, Blackaby, the author of Experience in God, writes, We should attempt things so great that they are doomed to failure unless God intervenes. Heard that before? We should attempt to do things so great that they are doomed to failure unless God intervenes. James 1 and 6 says, But when you ask him, be sure that your faith in, is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is unsettled as the wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. We need to show by our actions that we believe God. We need to show by our choices that we believe God. And we need to show by our priorities that we believe God and respond in obedience. James 1.22, but don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says. Otherwise you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in the mirror. mirror. You see yourself, walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it.
We need to respond by faith in God's promises. We need to respond by faith in God's faithfulness. And we need to respond by faith in God's greatness. Well, how did Abraham respond to all this? It says he worshipped the Lord. A great way to respond in faith and obedience to God's call in our lives is to bring others to a place of worship. In verse 7 it says, Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, Give this land to your, I will give this land to your descendants. And Abraham built an altar there and dedicated to the Lord who had appeared to him. Another way in which Abram was blessed, was a blessing was in the first two communities that he came to, in Shechem and Bethel, he set up altars. While we logically assume that their purpose was for worship, the text specifically states that they were used to worship Yahweh. The phrase translation, translated worship the Lord carries with it more than just the idea of worship. It literally means he proclaimed the name of Yahweh. We can see in Abraham's life of worship that he moved from there, he went to the hill country between Bethel and Ai, and again he built an altar. It says there he built another altar and dedicated to the Lord, and he, guess what? Worshipped the Lord. The account of Abraham's entry into the land of Canaan is very selective. Only three sites are mentioned. Shechem, the place between Bethel and Ai, and the Megiddo. Significantly, significantly, these are the same three locations visited by Jacob when he returned to Canaan from Haran. As well as the same three sites occupy the account of the conquest of the land under Joshua. It was worship that Abraham established there that set the stage for God's blessing to come. Interesting stuff, isn't it? I learned a lot through this study, doing this message. Years ago, this will, this will, you'll like this thing. Years ago at a conference in the Presbyterian Church, people were given a helium balloons filled and were told to release them at some point in the service when they felt like expressing joy in their hearts. Since they were Presbyterians, like reverends, they weren't free to say, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. All, all through the service, balloons ascended. But it was when it was over that one third of the balloons were not released. Let your balloon go. We should praise him for who he is. Second Samuel 22 verse 50 says, For this, O Lord, I will praise you amongst the nations. I will sing praises to your name. And we've done that this morning, haven't we? We can praise him because of his love. We can praise him because of his greatness. Praise him because of his power. Praise him for his mercy. We should praise him for what he has done. Praise the Lord for he has shown me the wonders of his unfailing love. He kept me safe when my city was under attack. So we praise him for saving us. Praise him for forgiving us. Praise him for protecting us. And we should continually praise him. Psalm 34 verse 1, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. Praise him when we wake up. Praise him during the day. Praise him when things are good and praise him when things are bad. So, in conclusion, we can learn from Abraham's call that God is the great I will. That we have a responsibility to respond to his call. That we need to respond in obedience and that we need to praise him. So how have you responded to God's call? In obedience? Or are you still thinking about it? Or you didn't respond at all? Have you kept your end of the deal as God has called you? And how evident 
is praise in your life. There's some questions to ponder and think over and reflect on the life of Abraham. Go back today or during the week, read Genesis, Genesis chapter 12 and think about all these things that we've talked about this morning. Don't just look in the mirror and walk away and forget about it. Reflect on it. Father, as we come into your presence this morning, we're just so astonished at the things that we can learn from your word. Every time we read it, if we read it with an open mind and we read it in prayer, asking you to, uh, to show us something new, you will do that. You'll definitely do that. Lord, we just think of Abraham and his life when you called him. He didn't think about it, didn't worry about it, didn't go and talk to other people about it. He just went and obeyed you. He followed what you told him to do. And you made his life into an enormous blessing that we are receiving today in our lives. So Lord, we just want to pray this week that as we open your your word, as we read it, as we go through these little books that, uh, that uh, Max talked about this morning, and we think about the reflective questions at the east of each, each, end of each day, Lord, help us to think through what we're doing. Not just to read the word and say, oh, that was nice, but to think through what you were trying to say to us through your word. So bless us as we do that. Bless us for the rest of this day and be with us throughout this week, we pray in Jesus' almighty name. And all the people said, Amen.